It's astounding how people can go about their lives without recognizing the era of improbable comfort made possible by a truly astonishing but taken for granted infrastructure. Everything that we consider Denverness depends on Denver water. It provides clean, reliable water source for 1.4 million people. But every time we provide a drop of water, we impact some community. They're a big impact and a big influence on really water throughout the West. This is some of the most affordable, cleanest, best water in the United States. The quality of life in Denver is completely contingent on Denver water. What people need to appreciate is the complexity of actually getting the water into the system. And then how water is delivered is also very complicated. We serve about 25% of the state's population, over a third of its economic activity. Really, Denver Water has a 100-year footprint across Colorado and across the West. Physically, politically, legally, and literally, we're connected all the way from the Missouri River to Mexico. I think that it's hard to grasp the scale and the scope of the size of it and the foresight of the people who acquired water rights so many decades ago in anticipation of the growth of our community. It was not uncommon for people coming into this area to say, well, this is a terrible place to settle. It was stark, it was largely treeless, and it just didn't look right. Americans had ideas of what a place should look like, and they involved a lot more greenery. Denver grew from a two-bit cow town on the banks of Cherry Creek and the South Platte River, and water was the limiting factor. The Indians said to the settlers who came and got in the Delta, because that was a nice place to be, it was sort of green, you could get access to water easily, they said, this is big flood area, you should not be here. And of course, that was absolutely the case because Cherry Creek and even the South Platte, a mile wide and an inch deep, you know, in a significant storm event, wiped out the city of Denver at least twice. There were as many as a dozen private companies started up digging ditches, diverting water from the Platte into the town, open ditches, and something way, way short of what we would consider proper provisions for water quality. The city ditch is started by a private company and then acquired by the city. They brought water out near Littleton, uh, from the South Platte and brought it down uh, through what we now call Capitol Hill to Denver. You can still see the remnants of the city ditch running through Wash Park and Smith Lake. And it's been described as the oldest working thing in Denver. Ever since the uh, city ditch opened in 1867, it's been flowing and feeds uh, Farrell Lake and City Park where it winds up. This was a time when communicable diseases like typhoid occurred with sort of heartbreaking frequency. There were six outbreaks in the latter decades of the 19th century here in Denver. All of those caused by water that had not been sufficiently cleaned. It was tainted with sewage. It just was becoming clearer and clearer and clearer that getting a source of water that was distant from the human habitations in Denver, up, way, way upstream from that, that was clearly the path of uh, literally saving lives and also restoring confidence in the water supply in Denver. David Moffat and Walter Cheeseman, the heads of the Denver Union Water Company, 
they were able to respond to this recognition that there had to be a way of bringing water in from far outside the city limits. So engineers explored the South Platte, went into the mountains, and found what really seemed like a perfect place to put a dam. They start construction in 1899, and it's very difficult to construct a dam in that site because it's remote and bringing in supplies and housing the workforce, that's really difficult. And then in May of 1900, just months into the construction process, a good share of what they constructed just taken out by heavy spring runoff. Just a remarkably overwhelming setback. They solicited a new design for the dam, a gravity arch, a graceful curving structure that goes back into the water so that the force of the water pressure pushes it more tightly together into the walls of the canyon. And in 1905, they were finished. They could store an enormous amount of water behind it, far more than Denver at the time could use in a single year and release that water down the South Platte as needed into the system, into the Kassler Treatment Center in Waterton Canyon. And it went through a series of sand filters. It would be largely cleaned of contaminants at that point and then brought into a closed system in wooden pipes that would bring it down into the city and distribute it to individual households. And it's not only beautiful, but it's so functional and it's so reliable to this day. Chisma Dam was designated as a National Historic Civil Engineering Landmark. It looks like it belongs to another time. The stone is cut from the cliff sides there so it fits. You see the individually carved blocks that make up the dam. It's not these solid sheets of concrete that you see in, in other dams. You know, it feels like it belongs. Building the dam, which would seem to be very difficult, that moves pretty fast. But getting the city coordinated, consenting, negotiating with the company in order to buy the private company, that's a really long process. And it goes from the 1890s till 1918. And all kinds of things pose speed bumps along that route. Probably the principal thing being the purchasing price. How much will the city pay for acquiring the Denver Union Water Company? The Denver Board of Water Commissioners was created in 1918 when the people of Denver voted to purchase the assets of the Denver Union Water Company. That document created a very unusual governing structure. The first sentence of Article 10, which is Denver Water's article, is there is hereby created a non-political Board of Water Commissioners, which I think is very important because it indicated that the people of Denver were not interested in water supply being in the hands of elected officials. The charter provides that all the revenue received by Denver Water must go into the Water Works Fund, and that the Water Works Fund can only be used for Water Works purposes. Those general provisions have not been changed over the years and it is a very solid, non-political board that's organized in a way that is insulated from other financial obligations, that's insulated from electoral politics. The people who were focused on building infrastructure in that first generation of settlers, they decided that they would build for the city that they envisioned would be here, rather than the city that was here and they built Cheeseman Dam in anticipation of a great city rather than for the dusty boom town that Denver was at the time. And I think that's a formula that they put in place that guided Denver's water development efforts for nearly the next century. It is a peculiar distribution of natural resources and population if you have 80% of the water falling on the western side of the state and you have 80% of the population living on the eastern side of the state, that's going to create a challenge and that is going to trigger episodes of intensive, aggressive human ingenuity transformed by human engineering.
Cherry Creek had become the public sewer. There was an ordinance against swimming in it, and no one with any sense would drink out of it. Fortunately, Mayor Robert Walter Speer becomes mayor in 1904 with the idea of transforming Denver uh, from a dusty, drab, unhealthy city with terrible polluted waterways into City Beautiful, or Paris on the Platte. The next plan had come into its early phase of existence by the recognition in the 1910s and in the 1920s that it would be a good idea to send agents from Denver to the Western Slope and to have those agents file water claims. In Colorado, it's prior appropriation. If you have filed a claim to water that is currently flowing you don't own the water, but you own the right to do something with that water if you can establish that you are going to put it to that beneficial use. First in time, first in right. Whoever was here first in time has the senior right. The problem with the prior appropriation system is if the river doesn't have enough water for everybody, a senior gets 100% and a junior gets nothing. So that's kind of a problem if you have a drought. By the 1930s, that is really starting to matter because that sense of, uh-oh, droughts and complacency don't go well together. And the need to anticipate the possible shortages or it's rough times ahead and angry citizens ahead. When the Dust Bowl settled in on the Great Plains in the 1930s, Colorado was the edge of it, but that meant that we were still seeing incredible dust storms that were darkening the skies in Denver during the mid-1930s. The Dust Bowl was accompanied by a ferocious drought, and that was leading to dwindling water supplies throughout the system. Denver Water responded with really a two-part strategy. One was to urge people to conserve. There were campaigns all around town that said water is life, water is vital, use it but never waste it. It was on the trolley cars, it was on posters and stores. But the other piece of that was to look to expand supply so that Denver wasn't reliant entirely on the flows in the South Platte. Since early, early days, various water companies had been looking across the Continental Divide at what water sources might be there and available to Denver. In the 1930s, Denver looked to the Fraser to bring water into the city along a path that didn't require the South Platte. So that meant that if the South Platte was suffering, there would be an alternative supply and vice versa. They went to the New Deal administration and specifically the Public Works administration and arranged financing for the Moffett Tunnel. The Moffat Tunnel was actually the exploratory tunnel that had been drilled as David Moffat was looking to build a railroad tunnel through the Rockies. The water board had been eyeing it for a long time as a potential water tunnel. And this was the moment they felt when they could realize that dream. Crews worked to expand and seal the tunnel and it was completed in 1936. Crowds actually gathered at the Eastern Portal to cheer the water coming through and on its way to Denver because they knew it would alleviate their concerns about the drought that was going on and really secure a reliable water supply for years to come. The Moffat Tunnel is in fact Denver moving into Trans Mountain Diversions and how many of those there were going to be that becomes more and more a source of concern to the Western Slope because there's also the Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District doing the same thing, the Western Slope is starting to wake up. By the end of the 1930s, there's an understandable what's gonna to happen to us on the Western Slope if this trend continues. In the early days of the development of Denver Water's infrastructure, Denver Water viewed a singular mandate to develop a water supply and frankly, didn't care who was hurt in that process, whether it was the environment, whether it was local communities on the Western Slope. They had a drive and a desire to develop infrastructure for Denver. We 
basically conflict was the norm. And I think preserving every option and fighting every fight um, and never really giving an inch, you know, started to really work against Denver Water. But I think it left a legacy of people thinking that Denver Water was sort of the gorilla in the room. It's not a historically accurate thing to single out Denver Water and to see it as the unilateral, exclusive, solo exerciser of power over water because the Bureau of Reclamation is a huge part of the story. And many different conservancy districts and irrigation districts, but a lot of that authority and power concentrates in Denver Water in large part because Glenn Saunders concentrated it there. Glenn Saunders, his first job was for what was at that time just in transition from the Denver Union Water Company to the Denver Water Department. And he is, this is totally important, gifted in a range of ways, one of which is that he was a, quite a good Shakespearean actor as a young person. So he goes to the University of Michigan Law School, comes back to Colorado, and as a young attorney, he's in the city office, he's delegated to work for Denver Water, so he's working with Denver Water from the 1920s but it's not till the 1950s that he becomes the official lead counsel and more and more and more the public face of Denver Water. Glenn Saunders was driven by what he viewed as his job to develop a water supply for Denver. He was not particularly concerned about the impacts of what he created. He was a lawyer who was after what he wanted for his client and whatever got in the way, he was gonna move out of the way. And that was the way that Denver Water ran in those days. I was a lawyer on the Western Slope, just out of law school. I met Glenn Saunders, did a couple of cases against him. I think from a Western Slope perspective, he was the personification of Denver Water and universally disliked. So as part of Western Slope DNA, one of your first responsibilities as a kid is to grow up and learn how to hate Denver water. Vail in 1965, Glenn Saunders was invited to speak to the advocates of open space preservation. There's a moment when you contemplate that where you think, uh-oh, somebody put the wrong address on an invitation. So Glenn Saunders spoke to an audience of conservation advocates with an amazing forthrightness. He said, I am standing before you as a person who will continue to dam rivers, who will continue to pursue the resource of water in order to support the city's growth because more people are coming. And if you don't do something about population, I will keep doing this and others like me will keep doing this. All of the actions of Denver Water at the time were a reflection of the time. So it was part of the process of a movement of people from the eastern part of the United States to the western part of the United States, both pre-World War II, but especially post-World War II, that drove large infrastructure development throughout the West. When you look at the development of Lake Powell, of Lake Mead, of any of the major reservoirs and key water infrastructure developments in the West, it was really, we have to tame rivers, we have to develop infrastructure for this growing population in the West. They had a grand vision for what Denver Water could be, and they delivered on that vision. And we're the beneficiaries of a vast and complex infrastructure that they developed and that we now benefit from. Identifying water, getting the water rights, building the infrastructure, and delivering it to far distant places is very complex. And the dams, the tunnels, the piping, the diversions, not only gathering all of it, but then making sure it isn't contaminated and polluted all the way from the source to the tap is a very sophisticated process. Dillon Reservoir is the largest reservoir within the Denver water system. It stores about 250,000 acre feet. The Denver system stores about 700,000 acre feet of water. So it's about a third of the total storage. You can really think of the Denver water system as having two arms. One is the water that comes through the Moffat Tunnel, and the other is the water that comes down the South Platte and the majority of the water at this point that we are using from the South Platte is actually coming from Dillon Reservoir in the Blue River. 
I love the Roberts Tunnel. It's an engineering marvel. It's enormously long, 23 miles underground, and it actually bends in the middle. It was the longest tunnel in the world at the time it was built. It takes that water from Dillon Reservoir down under the Continental Divide and brings it out to a spot along the South Platte where it can flow then down to Denver by a series of other pieces of infrastructure. The town of Dillon we know today was purchased almost lock, stock, and barrel by Denver Water and moved to its present location south of the reservoir. The collection system that feeds into the Moffat Tunnel, which is how Gross Reservoir is filled, is a collection of 34 different diversion structures that either stop the flow of water completely or bypass some water. They're in a horseshoe shape around the Fraser Valley, so all water headed down into the valley is either completely diverted or partially diverted. And from there, this collection system can flow via gravity to the Moffat Tunnel through the divide into South Boulder Creek and then fill Gross Reservoir. 11 Mile Dam, it was built in the 1930s. It's about 85,000 acre feet. And Antero, it's a large reservoir, but not very deep. You have Strontia Springs Dam, which was built in the 80s, Foothills Treatment Plant. Williams Fork is another unique one. It's probably the farthest away from Denver. Then Denver Water has some smaller reservoirs. Ralston Dam is pretty good sized and holds water to move to the Moffat Water Treatment Plant. You need pump stations to get it to the treatment plant and then treat the water to the high standard and then protect it throughout all piping and valving and get that all the way to the tap. You have the planning division that identifies the water and then you have the engineering division that builds it and then you have the operation maintenance division that maintains it. And then the legal division that protects it and maintains those supplies for Denver. Homes built before 1959 in the city and county of Denver did not have a water meter. Those homes were billed on a formula rate. How many bathrooms, how many bedrooms, and the bill was the same January through December, year after year. The drought of 1977 really opened people's eyes about the fact that their lawns didn't need that much water. And so that coincided perfectly with helping people understand how to use water wisely. So we developed the world's first xeriscape garden with cooperation from the landscape industry. The decision that Denver Water was going to install meters on every property was huge. When Denver Water decided everybody was going to have a meter, that's when Mayor Pena said, I want to be first. I believe our TV ads encouraged and motivated some folks to take water conservation even a step further than they would have taken it in the past. Poundstone Amendment had been passed in the early 70s, and the amendment basically said the city and county of Denver cannot further expand its boundaries without a vote of the people who will be the 
victims, that was what was implied, of this expansion. Glenn Saunders viewed that political initiative as a way to confine him and confine the plans that Denver Water had made. Denver Water, after Poundstone, had said, if you suburbs, you think you're going to control Denver's future growth, here's something for you to consider. Inside the city charter of the city and county of Denver is a clause that says, the people of Denver are entitled to receive water supply at cost, and the people outside Denver are entitled to receive water supply if we like to do so at cost plus an additional amount. Guess what? You're paying the additional amount, and here it is for every one of you. The suburbs around Denver did not really have water supply access. Many of them were created originally with groundwater supplies, but the wells started to go dry. And by the 50s and the 60s, they were starting to run out of water. That circumstance was what drove the negotiations for Two Forks. It was an application for a 404 permit from the Corps of Engineers that the applicant, Denver Water, had to obtain. There was tremendous national opposition. Basically an array of Western Slope political interest, Western Slope water rights interest, environmentalist, downstream users, many, many opposing interests. But we had good lawyers. We had Sandra Snyder still representing Denver Water Board. We were well prepared. Denver was growing, Metro area was growing. They needed to develop many more water supplies. They needed a large project to do it, and Two Forks was to be that project. Many people working at Denver Water's primary mission from 70s and 80s was the planning, design, and ultimate construction of Two Forks. The nation was shifting course. An array of environmental laws being passed by Congress, including the Wilderness Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Clean Water Act, on and on, the nation was shifting toward an environmental ethic. Denver Water, on the other hand, was continuing to move down the monolithic and linear path of water supply development, and Two Forks was a reflection of that. When you move through the 70s and take a look at what happened right here in Colorado, you find that the environmentalists and others who oppose just unfettered development of water resources had some leverage that they'd never had before. And it was a debate about growth in the Denver metropolitan area. And at that time, both sides looked at water and water development as a stimulant to growth. But you can't either stimulate growth, nor can you constrain growth by investments in water projects or preventing investments in water projects. We named ourselves the Colorado Environmental Caucus. We were willing to accept that Denver and the metropolitan area needed more water. If we want to protect the environment, then we've got to set that aside and look at the merits of how we supply water to the Denver metropolitan area. And we went in with this idea that we could do it without building large projects. During that early time in my career, I can remember one time up on the third floor of the administration building where Glenn Saunders plotted a strategy on how we were going to force Two Forks through the process. That was the old Denver water. And I got exposed to that with Glenn Saunders uh, basically saying, all we have to do is just keep on pushing forward. We'll win this battle through the politics in Washington if we have to. Um, but we can't give in to any of these crazy people. We knew that Denver at one time had a plan to enlarge growth reservoir. And so we said, well, we can go, go to growth reservoir itself, enlarge that. That's a footprint that is already there. Denver Water put everything that we had into the Two Forks project, and the belief that we were going to win was complete all the way to close to the end. I think that the general concern for the environment had a lot of people on the side of the environmental perspective, and that just grew over time. 
the staff of the Environmental Protection Agency was very receptive to looking at alternatives, to considering what could be done in the way of smaller projects. And in fact, the EPA ultimately took our proposal and gave it to an outside consultant for review to see whether or not it, it stood up to real analysis. And they decided it did. The EPA people that we were dealing with were all from Washington, and they were talking about the Cheeseman Canyon, which would be inundated by the construction of two forks, as if it was some kind of Sistine Chapel. We thought, well, let's just get them out here. Let's get all those stuffed shirts from Washington out here to Colorado and show them that the Cheeseman Canyon isn't that spectacular, and we have lots of those canyons out here. So I was charged with setting up the tour, and I walked around the trail for the first time thinking about what people from Washington, D.C. that just came out of 95 degree temperature with 100% humidity and all the traffic would see. And I came around the corner where you first see Cheeseman Canyon, and I said, Two Forks is dead. They felt that they had entered Nirvana. And I could see it on their faces, and there was no way they were going to change the opinion that this canyon was something special. Governor Romer, we had a meeting with him and he said, all right, I'm tired of beating around the bush here. I want to know what plan B is. <laughs> when you don't get this permit, what's plan B? And I said, Governor, there is no plan B. This is a metropolitan cooperation process that would provide water to the entire metropolitan area. There's no other way to do it. George Bush ran as the environmental president against Mike Dukakis. And with the selection of Bill Riley for the EPA, I think he was trying to send a message that, see, this individual comes out of the environmental community and he's highly regarded. So I called his press assistant as soon as Bill Riley was nominated. And I said, we have, we have the perfect example for President Bush to demonstrate that he's the environmental president. The Two Forks application was considered by and ultimately ruled on by the EPA administrator and he ruled against Denver and the suburbs. It was a national story. It was in the New York Times, it was in the Miami Herald. I mean, it was, it was that big a story. That This was a major dam project that had been vetoed. There were actually deaths that I attribute in the organization that I attribute to uh, the stress of that. There were divorces and there was a whole bunch of people that retired. I found myself with all my mentors gone and Denver Water was cast adrift without any real leadership on where we were going in the future. So the old way of water development in the West was hook up with a U.S. Bureau of Reclamation or a huge water provider and assemble your supporters and assemble the funding and basically the water project would be approved. You build a dam, that's just how it worked. With the veto of Two Forks, that era was dead. There was a document written by Hubert Farbs called The New Path, and it was the new path of Denver Water after the veto of Two Forks. We said part of what we will be doing to protect your future water supply, supply for your children and your grandchildren, is that you will responsibly use water. This is what we've got to do now. We have to conserve what we have. It's a recognition of what we need to do because we now have limited supplies. In the post Two Forks era, the appointment of Chips Berry as the manager of Denver Water was brilliant. He was the right person at the right time for Denver Water to move us past Two Forks and into the future. He was able to begin with his board to develop a new path forward and a new ethic for water development that 
embraced conservation, that began to look at water reuse and water recycling, that looked at infrastructure development from a new perspective of collaboration, partnership, and environmental sustainability. Chips came from the Department of Natural Resources from the state. He had a background in the law. He also had a background working in the island nations in the Pacific with very diverse people. He knew how to work with people with different perspectives. I think CHIPS brought up the morale in the department and helped people see that yes, there is life after Two Forks. He brought not only that outsized sense of humor, but an awareness of the outside politics, of the needs of the environment, of the needs to collaborate. It was during his tenure that we developed the famous Use Only What You Need conservation campaign that was based on kind of quirkiness and humor and developed almost a brand for Denver Water of being kind of just a little bit off-center. CHIPS was the epitome of what the Denver Water Board, that historic, aggressive, evil institution, <laughs> needed to become. A friendly face, a neighbor, you know, a cooperator in the future of water development for the whole state. Patty Wells comes from a distinctive background of all sorts of civic engagement, of representing good causes of environmental issues in some instances as well, but she still is the uh, successor to Glenn Saunders, and she will still litigate on behalf of Denver Water. When I arrived, in 1991, not only had Two Forks just been vetoed, but we were in the middle of a huge lawsuit with our distributors, our suburban customers who are inside our service area. They were suing us over rates. So we were kind of at war with pretty much everyone. <laughs> we needed to rethink how to do things. The board was adamant that we'd fix how much water we were going to need in the future. So we created the service area which exists today by drawing a line around the boundaries of all our distributors. We still call it the new distributor contract, but it was actually 1994. It promised them that we would provide the water that they needed unless it was impossible for us to do so. It did away with the provisions that allowed us to treat outside city customers differently than inside city customers in a drought. Denver Water had a great deal of skepticism on the Western Slope and throughout Colorado to overcome in the post Two Forks era. And there began to be the development of personal and professional relationships and the ability to actually talk and collaborate and discuss potential ideas about future water supply development. That helped build the beginnings of trust between the Western Slope and Denver Water. The Colorado River Cooperative Agreement was negotiation, I think, a little more than collaboration. You know, the position on the West Slope has always been not one more drop, so that's not a good starting point. <laughs> um, but what Denver Water needed was security of supply. And through six years of sitting around a table, wasn't always fun. There was emotion, there were some tears, but you do kind of get to know people and what it is that they really need. People on the West Slope just thought of Denver Water as the 800 pound gorilla and they just do what they want. And I would occasionally say, why don't you think of Denver Water as 300,000 school children? Maybe that will make you feel a little differently about what it is that we do. One of the best examples of how CRCA changed things is the creation of Learning by Doing, which is an effort in Grand County. When there is an environmental problem, instead of seeking a culprit, instead the group says, what is the problem? What might be causing the problem? What resources do we collectively have that we can bring to bear to resolve that problem? And that's what they do. Colorado River Cooperative Agreement provided for environmental benefits in Summit and Grand, Mesa, Garfield County. So in essence, it addressed all the present day issues 
that were facing Denver Water and facing those communities in a way that those communities could support and Denver Water could support. I think my favorite new saying when I speak publicly now is conservation begins with conversation. So the negotiations led to a compromise that we both could live with that's going to protect the health of the Fraser River for years to come and it's going to provide a water supply to meet some of this growth that we can't seem to be able to stop from coming to Colorado. I talk to people from other states who are amazed that we actually are getting together and cooperating how water is distributed rather than fighting over it. Colorado River Cooperative Agreement should be the template for the future of all rivers in the western United States. What I really like about Denver Water is that we are a leader in the industry. 1,100 employees and they all have different diverse personalities and, and professions. We are constantly looking at improvements and advancements and efficiencies to be able to do our job better. People put pride into their work. It's part of who they are. When you turn on that spigot, people expect water. About 60,000 feet of pipe that we're replacing. Quality treatment begins in the headwaters of our watersheds. We put water back into the Colorado to maintain the health of the Colorado River. I work here as the operations supervisor at Dillon Reservoir. Gross Reservoir is a drinking storage water facility. Denver water is better than bottled water because it is more regulated and it's more environmentally friendly. What people need to know about Denver water is all the, the time and the effort, the 100% we put in to serving our customers, they don't see behind the scenes. It takes a lot to get water from the snowflakes in the mountains down to customers' taps in the city. We have a very robust system that was developed over the years. We are on 24-7, 365. There are planners taking into consideration climate change, density changes in the Denver metropolitan area, and changes in where water sources will be coming from and water quality will be changing. The resources are so stretched on the western slope that we had to start turning our attention to reusing water. Our water supply now and our future is downstream of Denver. And that's where the WISE project, which is the water infrastructure and supply efficiency project, came into play because downstream of Denver is where all our reusable water ends up into the South Platte River. We take water that is returning after people use it one time and then we take it through multiple treatment processes and turn it back into treated water. It's similar to what's on the space shuttle. It fulfills the commitment of the New Path Agreement to provide to Denver Waters area, but also support and encourage the development of some of the areas in the Denver Metro area. Wise does that. It uh, reuses water that would have otherwise have been lost to the area and enables some other communities to have that water. There's been a reduction of 20% of the water use today from what was used 10 or 15 years ago. And our population has grown dramatically at the same time. So people are conserving. It's a big partnership. Our customers, our distributors, the professionals, our partners in Western Colorado and in the metropolitan area. It's really all of us working together to assure a bright water future for Colorado. More and more people are realizing that you don't have to be a water engineer or a water attorney to have uh, impact on water. You start with yourself and in your home and outside your home and then you move beyond that to what you're passionate about. That's how an individual makes change in the future. We face a vast array of challenges in the next hundred years that I can't even begin to describe because of course we don't know what those are going to be. We're currently in the process of revamping our integrated resource plan which is a 50-year look ahead into the future. Our growth in the next 50 years has to look different on the front range than the last 50. And that is for water reasons as much as it is for air quality and transportation. And I think Denver Water understands the importance of making sure we're a denser, tighter community to ensure we have the water that we need. One Water, it's the latest catchphrase to try to capture 
really looking at integrating water resources, drinking water, wastewater, storm water, all the different types of water. They've been treated separately, they've been managed separately, they've been regulated separately. So One Water is an effort to break down those barriers between policy and technology issues and start to integrate all the different types of water. Denver Water is rebuilding its main office administration campus and took this opportunity to do some really creative things and demonstrate some new approaches to the One Water concept. We took a long look at the operations center of Denver Water and in planning the redevelopment of this facility and the rebuilding of uh, buildings that in some cases were more than 50 or 70 years old. We learned a lot about how we can operate more efficiently. We're also building a campus that will demonstrate our commitment to the future development, sustainability, and engagement of the Denver metropolitan community on a scale that has not been done in Colorado. I like what Denver Water does, which is to provide an essential service that is absolutely reliable, reasonably priced, always there, tastes great. And we do that without being too intrusive into people's lives. Experts always there doing the right thing. I think that sums up what Denver Water is. I'm more optimistic now than I have been in 15 years. I think that as long as we continue to hold the conversation, we can make those very difficult things happen. You know, I, I have tremendous faith in Denver Water because of their ability to lean in, not only on the challenges, but to make sure that stakeholders along the Front Range and even in the mountain areas, um, as well as our region outside of the state of Colorado, are engaged and they are communicating with them to work on these challenges, to make sure we're meeting them head on. I think we thought of ourselves for a long time narrowly as a utility, and that meant you find water, you transport water, you treat water, you distribute it, and you build the people that used it, and that's what we do. And we want to do that well. But I don't think that's who we are really anymore. I think now we're sort of in the stewardship business, stewards of this incredible water resource and all the things that rely on it. The health of our watersheds, the health of the aquatic environment, the economic health of the Western Slope, are just as important to Denver Water and our ability to supply water 100 years from now as is our treatment plants, our dams, our reservoirs in the delivery of that water supply. If we destroy the environment that provides our drinking water, we're not serving the interests of our customers 100 years from now. My hopes for the future of Denver and Denver Water are that we continue to chart new territory we figure out how to stretch an acre foot further. We figure out how to leave as much of the water in the places where we love to encounter it, the streams up in the mountains and out on the plains and, and in the canals running to farms and ranches, but that we also continue to recognize that this is one of the world's great places to live. And for as long as we can record in history, people have been wanting to come and live here those early commissioners at Denver Water saw what could happen here, how this community might grow, and knew that without water, nothing would happen. The commissioners today feel that part of our job is to have that same kind of foresight for the generations that come after us, and we take that responsibility seriously. We have great examples to learn from of what people did 100 years ago to anticipate what the city could possibly look like. And it's a great legacy. We're looking at supply options. We are looking at policy options. We're looking at how we work with other utilities so that we can all have access to water when we need it, where we need it. We are looking at how we work with our customers so our customers understand and are empowered to use water in the best way. Denver Water is doing everything they need to to sustain Denver into the next century.